Um, awesome. Thank you very much, Carly. And thank you, everyone, for having me along today. Um, as Carly mentioned, my name is Bo Newell. I'm the National Program Manager for Pride in Sport Australia. Um, I'm going to start just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which I'm on today, um, Iwabakal Nation, and also pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging, uh, and also acknowledge any um, any Indigenous or people of colour who may be in today's session, um, and thank you very much um, for your contributions. Um, so as Carly said, um, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about Pride in Sport as a program and to give you a little bit of a snapshot as to what some of the statistics and research show us when it comes to LGBTQ inclusion in sport more broadly. Um, and also because um, I'm pretty sure all of you, if not uh, most of you, would be employed in some capacity to work in this space within sport, I wanted to share with you also a little bit of um, uh, information around um, LGBTQ inclusion within the workplace as well. So we'll touch on that very, um, uh, very shortly. Um, as we sort of go through the presentation, I'm more than happy if people have any questions. Um, I'm not the sort of person to kind of say wait until the end. If you've got something you want to ask, please feel free to go ahead and ask it at that time. Happy for you to use the chat function. I know Carly's moderating that um, and she can um, yeah, pop in at any stage and, and um, tell me to stop, start or answer any questions. So we'll get started. And um, again, hopefully everyone can see the screen here. I wanted to quickly give you a, a very short snapshot of what Pride in Sport is, because I know some of you are aware of our program, but some may not be. Uh, so in essence, our program is a not-for-profit uh, program, sporting inclusion program, specifically des to, uh, designed to assist sporting organisations at all different levels with the inclusion of LGBTQ uh, people. Uh, we are also the facilitators and the moderators of the Pride and Sport Index. And I'm, again, I know some of you have heard of this, but in a snapshot, this index is the national benchmarking tool which allows us to measure every organisation's LGBTQ inclusion um, from a scale of uh, getting the organisations to, uh, to answer specific questions and provide evidence in specific areas that give us this information. Uh, the benchmarking also allows organisations like yourselves to compare and contrast as to where you currently sit compared to organisations very similar to yourself in the space of LGBTQ inclusion. So to give you an example, if we have state sporting organisations that do the index, once they get their results back, they can compare their results with other state sporting organisations. And for yourselves, in most cases, it would be you'd be able to compare your current LGBTQ inclusion practices um, compared to other university sport organisations. Similar to Pride in Sport, you can see some of the logos down the bottom there. We also have um, what we call Pride in Diversity and Pride in Health and Wellbeing. So as you can imagine, Pride in Sport, we're just focused on the sports sector. Pride in Diversity is our corporate partner um, where they deal with all the major um, government agencies, the big banks, even all organisations all the way down to the local cafes and coffee shops um, that want to do work in this space. And then we have Pride in Health and Wellbeing, which as you can probably imagine is for the health and wellbeing sector. So they deal with uh, like GPs, clinicians, hospitals, um, all of those sorts of things. So between the three of us, we all have our um, dedicated index or indices. So I just mentioned to you briefly about the sport index. There's also a health dedicated index and a corporate index. Um, but between the three of us, um, we uh, we have very similar questioning and very similar recommendations when it comes to what best practice is in the space of LGBTQ inclusion. Um, and we also are enabled, we're enabled to support organisations in our dedicated areas to achieve good results in this space. Um, we're also the facilitators um, of the country's only and largest LGBTQ uh, inclusion conference that's held once a year. Um, we were very thankful last year that um, we had um, Chris and Bridget from um, Melbourne University Sport come along and speak at this particular conference. I know we had a number of university sport representatives there as well. So I encourage you to um, keep an eye on that. And if you want to find out any more information, happy to point you in that direction. 
Um, and then the final one there, the little logo down the bottom left, you can see is the LGBTI Inclusive Employers. Um, so this is a dedicated website where um, organisations can create a profile for people from within the LGBTQ community to go to that may want to find a specific employer that they know is inclusive to them as an individual. So for Pride and Sport members, um, in most cases, we either encourage or we adopt straight away that the fact that um, you will have a profile and you can update how inclusive you are if you have specific inclusive practices that you want to share with people. Um, very similar attributes as to what um, equal opportunity um, legislation sort of encourages us to do, but this is more so just a platform where people who may not necessarily want to work for an organisation that isn't inclusive can kind of go to this and find out, um, you know, who is inclusive in this space and find out a bit more. Um, a little bit of context as well, so I won't go through all of these in detail, but you can see here um, just by the logos that we've got on screen that we have a number of sporty organisations that we've worked with over the last couple of years. These range from national sports to state sports, and you can see there's a couple of university sports on there as well in the sense of Melbourne University Sport, Macquarie Sport and RMIT Uni Sport. Um, and I know I've had multiple conversations with um, uh, some of you in the room today and, um, and other universities about um, also joining as members uh, and finding out more about how we can help you in this space. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in later in uh, the session. We, we're very lucky at Pride of Sport too that we're not necessarily, or we're not just a program that was started out of an initiative that was from the LGBTQ community that wanted to advocate for this change. We were, we were very lucky in the early days of Pride and Sport that we had the backing um, and uh, the corporate push um, from Sport Australia, so which was then the Australian Sports Commission, as well as the Australian Human Rights Commission, which were instrumental in actually putting our program together uh, and engaging with ACON. So ACON is um, the organisation that I work for that Pride and Sport is a part of. Um, and ACON is the largest LGBTQ health organisation in the country. So between ACON, the Human Rights Commission and Sport Australia, um, we're in very good stead to have the subject matter expertise, um, the guidance and the assistance between these three organisations to ensure that this program is beneficial for everyone who, uh, who either joins it or um, works, with this, works with us in some way, shape or form. Um, I wanted to touch with you, touch on very briefly some of the work behind the scenes um, that I have no doubt that most of you, if not all of you, would have seen within the media in some capacity um, that you may not necessarily have known that we had something to do behind the scenes, um, whether that be with the individuals or the organisation in question. Um, and on screen here, you can see the very first one was back with the marriage equality debate a number of years ago. We played a very vital role within the sporting community and getting uh, the sporting organisations on board to show their support for the yes vote. Um, as one of our major partners in Rugby Australia, we also played a very high profile um, role in assisting um, with the support of Rugby Australia staff when it came to the incidents between them and Israel Folau over the last 12 to 24 months as well. Uh, similar to that, we had a role to play with Cricket Australia when one of their players um, unintentionally came out um, or was seen to be that he came out, but in fact, he actually, actually didn't. So that caused a bit of a crisis. And we, again, we played a bit of a support role there for Cricket Australia. Aside from some of the negative commentary that you may have seen in the media, we also played a very positive role in the coming out of Andy Brennan, um, who is a football player, used to play in the A-League, so for FFA, um, and is the first out openly gay or bi male in professional sport um, for a number of years. Um, so it was really exciting to be part of that journey with him. We also played a very heavy role with um, the Australian Sports Commission and Sport Australia uh, sorry, and, and the Human Rights Commission um, in the development of their trans and gender diverse guidelines for people in sport. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen this. And again, this is a resource that's available on our website if you'd like to have a look a little bit further. We were also um, heavy players in the development of Cricket Australia's trans and gender diverse guidelines for community cricket and uh, subsequently assisted them through some of the commentary and challenges that they faced um, with not just people within their sport, but from 
local politicians all the way up to the Prime Minister. Um, so we uh, we assisted um, most of the diversity inclusion staff, their media and corporate staff, all the way up to their CEO in terms of ensuring that the language that they're using was appropriate um, for the work that has, had been done. Similarly, on the flip side um, with Tennis Australia, I, I have no doubt that most of you, if not all of you, have heard different things about Margaret Court and Tennis Australia. So again, we bit, played a bit of a role behind the scenes there in making sure that Tennis Australia was adequately supported. Um, and a lot of that work comes down to um, not necessarily giving us giving advice as to say, this is what you should do. Um, in most cases, it would be they would come to us and say, this is what we're thinking of doing. Can you help us to make sure that our language um, and our delivery is appropriate um, and going to be, um, for the most part, accepted by the LGBTQ community. So they're just some of the little examples uh, behind the scenes that I wanted to share with you today. So now I want to jump into what is some of the facts? What are the things that we know in this space? And I mentioned earlier that I'm going to talk about two separate areas. So I'm going to start within the workplace. So thinking about yourselves as individuals working for a university or a uni sport organisation, uh, and then we'll dive into the sporting context more broadly. So if we're looking at the workplace, some of the things that we know, um, and these statistics are very, very recent. So the first one here is that only 45% of people with a diverse sexual orientation are completely out in the workplace. So that means um, people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, for example, um, only 45% of them on average are completely out within the place where they work. Now, this has actually come quite interesting because this 45% came out of a survey that was released just last month. And comparatively to 12 months ago, that statistic was 63% of people that are out. Now, in most cases of research, this is actually quite a substantial difference between 45% and 63. And although we don't necessarily, um, or we're not necessarily able to put our finger directly onto what that cause is, um, we do know that there may be a number of factors as to you know, why people may be either going back in the closet or more broadly why people are um, you know, in the closet this year compared to last year. And we saw very similar statistics back when the marriage equality debate was happening in the sense that there was a lot more public commentary within the media um, and it was a much more high profile topic of discussion um, across the country. And at the time when this survey was done, so the, the latest one, the one that gave us that 45%, um, you, you may recall that this was, and this was late last year, there was quite a lot of media attention and hype around the religious discrimination bill that was happening at the time and a lot of conversations happening within Canberra. So knowing that, that, that could play a part in it, but like I said, we don't have a definitive answer, but it's interesting nonetheless to know that the number actually has gone back slightly. Uh, we can also see here that 16% of employees were the targets of un unwanted jokes or innuendo, um, and 23% of those targeted um, target of un unwanted jokes or innuendo or negative commentary uh, were because of someone's gender identity. So not necessarily their sexual orientation, but their gender identity itself. Um, so I won't go through these other ones here, but um, I'll ha happy to send these to you afterwards as well, so you can have a look a little bit further. Now, if we look at the sports setting, some of the most interesting statistics that we have on hand um, are some of these. So we know that 80% of participants in sport have either witnessed or experienced some form of homophobia. So similar to what we said with the workplace ones, these could be things of someone saying simple quotes that, uh, you know, as a part of a game saying words like faggot, poof, dyke, um, those sorts of terminology can be used uh, or have been used rather. Uh, we also know that 75% of people believe an openly gay person um, wouldn't be safe as a spectator at a sport. So we're not even talking about participating now, we're talking about someone sitting in the grandstand, um, or, you know, on the bleachers on the side watching a game. These are some really dramatic statistics. And the unfortunate thing that we've seen, and so this research came out in 2015, um, subsequent research since then um, aren't necessarily promising at this stage in the sense that most of the statistics um, remain the same. And it's only now that we're starting to get sporting organisations um, to be aware of this number um, so that we can change it for the better. 
Uh, an interesting one that I also like to share with people here is that 87% 80, of gay men and 75% of lesbians are completely or partially in the closet while playing youth sport. And the reasons for these are things like them fearing discrimination, um, hatred, the innuendo, that sort of stuff. Um, and this isn't just the, the fear that those things are going to be coming from a player. Um, there is also a fear that they will have um, discrimination or vilification coming from coaches and officials within their sport as well. Now take that statistic, so the 87 and 75%, compare that to the workplace. Um, you can see that there are more people um, in the closet within the sporting context as opposed to the workplace context. Um, and I think, and again, this is one of the other things we can't necessarily put our finger on to say this is the reason why, but we do know that historically sport in Australia has had a traditional sense of homophobia to it. Um, I know a lot of sports do quite a lot of good things to alleviate um, this perception that, you know, sport is homophobic or transphobic. Uh, but the reality is uh, sport historically has had this um, perception about it and it will take a little bit more work for sporting organisations to actually change that perception. Some research that came out uh, again just a, a month or two ago from a researcher at Western Sydney University also showed us that um, people considered sport to be hostile or unwelcoming to young people with diverse sexualities and genders. So this particular research looked at um, those between the ages of 10, uh, or it might have been 12 uh, and 21. And some of the things that came out of this were some interesting facts saying that negative media attention, for example, is a key indicator as to why young people will not choose a specific sport. And while, again, the statistics and the information that came out of this were quite broad, um, it was more of a qualitative um, research uh, as opposed to qualitative, we can only assume that things like hearing all of the news stories about Israel Folau or Margaret Court, for example, may be factors uh, as to why a young person wouldn't choose that specific sport. Uh, again, there's similar attributes to this research that show that um, uh, change rooms in particular are the common area um, that, in, that cite stress, harassment and bullying for young people with diverse sexualities and genders. We also know that traditional male sports uh, in particular were seen unwelcoming and toxic spaces for young men with diverse sexualities or genders. So a young child or you know, a young teenager who identifies as gay or bisexual, um, most of them or more of them would have a fear to participate in a predominantly male sport because of that unwelcoming or toxic perception that that sport has. In addition to some of these ones, I want to talk very briefly about some of the mental um, uh, mental health and well-being aspects that we've found. And this is an interesting one that we know that trans and gender diverse populations are far more likely to report experiencing verbal or physical abuse than the general population. So when we want to do this comparatively, if we're talking about physical attacks, for example, almost 20% um, of the young gender diverse or sexuality diverse population will experience these compared to the general population. Um, more than five times uh, the rate for sexual assault for people who identify as um, sexuality or gender diverse. Um, and similar to that with the verbal abuse or social exclusion. These are only some of the reasons as to why this statistic is now known and that 48% of transgender young people have attempted suicide. That's almost half of the young trans population that have attempted to take their life. There's a slightly higher statistic for those that have actually thought about suicide, but these are the ones who have actually attempted to take their own life. But there is some good news that we do know from this. So we know that 48% of those young people have attempted to take their life. However, if sporting organisations in particular take this active approach to improving the inclusion uh, and diversity for uh, young trans and gender diverse people, we can see an 82% reduction in attempts um, of suicide with these high levels of social support. And this is where sport comes into the mix. 
So if we do these attributes, if we do things, and I'll explain a little bit more about what these activities can be, but if a sport actively does work specifically in the LGBTQ inclusions uh, sector, we can see a 71% reduction in depression symptoms. We can see a 34% reduction in thoughts of suicide. Um, and we can reduce the attempts of suicide by at least 65%. Now, this is statistics and research that have come from a number of organisations, um, uh, including the likes of the LGBTQ Health Alliance, um, which regularly take this research and statistics, um, uh, sorry, regularly take these um, research initiatives on uh, to get us the most recent data. So there is some good news in it. So now I want to share with you what you can do. So what you can do within your workplace and what you can do for sport in uh, those sports that you work with. The first of which um, I mentioned to you very briefly at the start is the Pride in Sport Index. So I mentioned to you that this is uh, a benchmarking tool that allows us to measure organisations LGBTQ inclusion more broadly. The good thing about this index is it's actually a world first um, for sport, but it's actually based off other indices that have worked quite well within the corporate sector um, for the last decade or more. Um, and with an organisation like yourselves participating in this in this index, you not only get a scorecard to say, okay, this is where you're doing well and this is where you're not, but you get the ability to have year on year results that will give you a, compare, a comparison to say, OK, we've improved our inclusive practices by this much um, on a yearly basis. Now, that, while that might not necessarily seem like a lot for yourselves, I can almost assure you that your board members in particular and those that are wanting to see good practices come out of your organisation will actually take the results from this index quite seriously. Um, and it could be detrimental to not just keeping people within your sport, but potentially increasing memberships across the board. You also have the opportunity, if you participate in this index, to take part in our national survey. So this is a survey for individuals. Now, you don't have to be a Pride in Sport member to do the index or to do the survey. But the good thing is, by doing the index, if we look at that side of it, that's your evidence. So that's saying this is exactly what we've done. Because if you fill this out, we ask for evidence and we ask for specific documents, these sorts of things, to verify that you have actually achieved these um, attributes. The survey, however, actually gives you a, a good understanding of what people's perception is of your sport. So, for example, we can actually begin to compare some of the work that's happened. So the index may ask a specific question around do you have an XYZ inclusion policy, for example? And if you provide that evidence and we give you the marks for it, you can say, yep, we know we've done this. On the flip side, if people do the survey, there'll be questions in there which point to governance around what inclusion, uh, what inclusion governance your organisation has. And after a number of questions, you can get the perception and what we've seen historically with some other sports that have done it, we, we tend to find a little bit of a disconnect in some areas. Um, and if it is the space of the, you know, the inclusion policy, for example, the survey might ask questions where people respond to say, um, you know, have you heard about our inclusive practices? Or do you think our organisation is inclusive to LGBTQ people? And if individuals start to answer no to some of those questions, when you get both of those results back from your index and from the survey, you can see where that disconnect is, and that's the tool which will help guide you as to the, the areas that you need to focus on in that next 12 month period. So if you've given us evidence and you've received marks to say that you have this particular piece of governance, however, the survey um, is showing us that people don't know about it, well then we can work with you then to improve things like communication um, and other uh, attributes to say, okay, well, we know that you've got this, how can we make sure that everybody else knows that you've got it, if that makes sense? Um, the last few things on here are really cool um, uh, that I like to make sure I emphasise to organisations because sometimes there is a bit of a fear to wanting to do work in this space. Um, and in fact, some people might say, you know what, we want to work on our inclusion stuff before we do the index. I'd say no, I'd say do it the other way around. Do your index now, regardless of whether you've done any work in this space, because that will give you a definitive measure to say, this is where you currently sit. Now, 
while I say that, why I say that is because some sports fear that, you know, their name or their brand might be connected to the fact that they haven't done any work in this space. But to put all of your fears aside, I can safely say that if you do the index, you can opt to, to do it anonymously. Um, that's where the only the results, uh, the results that you, um, you get from the index will only go to you and are only seen by me and my staff and those who mark the indices. Um, and the best part about this too is that it's free. So you don't need to pay to do the index. You can jump on our website now and see last year's version of the index. The new index version will be coming out in the next month or so. Um, and I'll certainly share this information with Kylie and the rest of the team and um, hopefully I'll get your contact details. Happy to share that new one with you when it comes out. Um, but please do take this up. This is a free resource. That there should be absolutely no reason as to why you shouldn't do this. Um, I know this is a really difficult time for some sports and some organisations too because of the pandemic um, and budgeting, those sorts of things. Um, but use and abuse this. Use this how, uh, as much as you possibly can. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions either now or as we go on with this um, a little bit later. I wanted to dive in real quickly as to, to give you a snapshot of what's within the index, because I've spoken a little bit about, you know, what we can achieve from it, but what is actually inside the index? You know, what are the questions that we ask? Um, and you'll see on screen here that there's five different um, sections that we uh, focus our attention on. Um, the largest of which um, is our governance and strategy sector. So this is the part where we ask questions like, you know, do you have any sort of strategic items in your strat plan that, you know, point to LGBT inclusion? You know, do you have an inclusion policy? Um, what sort of accountability is there? You know, do you have a diversity inclusion officer? These sorts of things, excuse me, um, uh, uh, just some of the questions within this part of the index. Um, we also go into some extra parts where we talk about dress codes and facility use and toilet use, member registrations. Um, and I have no doubt at some point or another, most if not all of you have had these sorts of thoughts in your head or you've had some similar conversations um, internally. And again, while you may not necessarily have achieved these things completely, the good thing is the index can actually be used as a bit of a guide because we don't just ask the question saying, do you have ABC? We ask the question, do you have ABC? But then we also um, articulate or, or stipulate exactly what is required to ensure best practice. So it's it's almost a bit of its own cheat sheet in a way because it'll ask you the question, but then it'll say, this is what you need to do to achieve this question uh, or achieve the result for this question. Um, so quite a lot within the governance and strategy area. The reason why there's probably more emphasis on that space, so governance and strategy compared to things like visibility or education, um, is that because we actually need the, the co context and we need um, what I like to call the meat on the bones, basically, before we dive into other visible visible areas like waving the flag. Um, and the reason for that is because if you happen to go out and you run pride games and all these sorts of things, there's not necessarily an issue with that. Um, but sometimes it can be felt like it's falling on deaf ears if an organisation decides to do a pride round, for example, that doesn't have any governance or policies to back up their claim to say that they are actually inclusive. Um, so this is probably why we spend a bit more time and, and effort within the governance section, at least to start with anyway. Uh, the second section here is education. So um, the biggest part of this is about doing training. So education and training sessions, these can be run internally uh, by yourselves, um, or if you're a Pride and Sport member, you have access to myself and my team where we can actually deliver um, awareness training, ally training, executive training, media training, um, all of these sorts of things, um, whether that be for staff at your organisation or whether we do specific training for athletes a part of your clubs or even your committees, for example. Um, in addition to that, we also have a section here to make sure that resources are um, actively available for people within your organisation. So that's the staff and, and the athletes. Um, these resources, we don't have a stipulation to say that you have to develop them because we recognise that that can be quite difficult. Um, but at the very least, we'd like to get you to uh, encourage you to share resources that are currently available. So they might be Pride and Sport resources. Um, you know, we might share resources that Melbourne University Sport have um, done, for example, or you know, a national sporting organisation is doing quite well in this space. Um, anything like that is is a good way to, again, show people that 
you're not only supportive of LGBTQ inclusion, um, but you have an, uh, an area or a space where you can point people to to find out more information. The fourth section is visibility. So I touched on this very briefly. So this can be things like doing, you know, pride games, pride rounds, that sort of stuff. Um, but this is a little bit more. So it's also about participating in LGBTQ days of significance. So some of you may have heard of things like Wear It Purple Day, Ida Hobbit. Um, there's also um, some more specific days. I think there's about 20 or 30 days throughout the entire year and spread out over every month you can participate in. Um, and another one of those is actually Pride Month that we're in now. So June every year is Pride Month. So it may be that we encourage you to do social media posts, for example, or if you have resources on a website, you might share those resources to try and educate people um, uh, you know, a little bit further through your social platforms. This can also be things about you know, what contributions you can do to potentially local media or your university media and communication strategy more broadly. Um, it's also about ensuring that we have adequate leadership. So your CEO or equivalent, um, you know, needs to be on board this this ride with you. So it's about getting them educated and upskilled so they have an appropriate message um, as the leader of your entity um, to show people that, you know, this isn't just a, a tick in the box and someone down the bottom is going to be doing this hard work. It's showing that people at the top are actually caring about this space too. Uh, we also encourage people to have different ambassadors, um, not just from the staff sector, but uh, sector, but also athletes as well. So these again can be individuals within your sports um, or your organisation that you can, um, for lack of a one about phrase, use and abuse in a lot of ways. You know, if they're keen to help you in this space, um, let's get them to help us because we need more people to do work in this area. Uh, and the last two sections on here around engagement. So when we talk about engagement, these can be things like um you know if you're doing a sponsorship pitch to try and get income uh, or you're doing a grant submission for funding those sorts of things as a part of those applications making sure that you put um aspects in there that promote um or show what areas of lgbtq inclusion you've been working on so if you have an inclusion policy for example or if you have an ambassador um, if you've got anything in the media that you can show that you've done or you've run a pride game those are the sorts of things that corporate organisations in particular are wanting to see. And we know that because, and you may remember at the very start of this, I mentioned we've got a partner program called Pride and Diversity. They've got about 400 corporate organisations across the country that are members of Pride and Diversity. And the one thing that we've found out just from them alone is that they want to sponsor organisations that match, that have similar values that match their own. Um, if we look at like some high profile examples, uh, for example, so Qantas, um, take away the pandemic situation at the moment, but you know, Qantas has been quite heavily involved in, you know, the LGBTQ inclusion space, marriage equality, that sort of stuff. Um, Alan Joyce, their CEO, is actually the patron of Pride and Diversity. Um, and I had a conversation with him midway through last year, and even he said that they will only sponsor organizations now that can prove that they have values that match Qantas's own values. Um, and so these can be things from a part of, you know, a part of your strategic plan. They can be pieces of governance, um, but whatever it is, they're not going to hand out money willy nilly anymore. They want to make sure that an organisation is getting it for the right reasons. Um, and, you know, you can probably connect some dots in some way, shape or form when it comes to, you know, one of the organisations that they sponsor is Rugby Australia and the stuff that they went through with Israel Folau albeit that Qantas absolutely had nothing to do with that whole scenario. Um, Rugby Australia are maintaining that sponsorship because of the active and positive work that they've done for LGBTQ inclusion more broadly. Um, so a very big example, but even for smaller examples too. So if you're looking at local community organisations um, or NGOs or um, you know big businesses near your particular university, I can almost guarantee you that they'll be wanting the same thing. So bearing that in mind. Uh, and then the final section on here is around research. So it looks like the smaller section, but if you actively participate in it, um, it can be a hefty chunk of the work that you do in this space. So I mentioned very briefly before about the national survey. So that's the one where we compare your index to the survey responses. So that's something that we uh, facilitate, excuse me, that we can help you with. Um, so participation in that can also achieve you points within your index submission. 
Uh, and then the second one on there is around academic research. Now, while this isn't necessarily something that every organisation can do, I would hope that yourselves being a part of universities, we can either help you with your internal academics or put you in touch with academics at other universities that may either be able to run a specific research um, project within your sporting cohort, um, or if not, surprisingly, an easy way to achieve points in this section is that we already know of quite a lot of researchers that are wanting to do work in this space, but they just don't have access to the number of players and the number of sporting participants. So it may just be that you can say to a researcher that's already doing work in this space to say, you know what, we've got four clubs at our university that are more than happy for you to come down to their training or to come down to a game day and ask some questions. Um, and just by doing that and being actively involved in a, another piece of academic research um, can again be a big part of uh, your inclusion work that you've done in this space. So that provides you a little bit of a snapshot. The last thing I'd say about these two, and while I haven't itemised them specifically on this page, every question will have a tier. So some questions are basic that we class as foundational questions, others are intermediate, so they're a little bit hard, and then the ones are, uh, which are really advanced, things like that, academic research. Um, for an organisation that is just starting out, I always recommend that when you have a look at the index, just focus on the foundation questions first. There's no use jumping straight into things like academic research if you don't have very simple initiatives in place, like a, uh, you know, a couple of points in a strategic plan or you know, making sure that someone in your organisation is accountable for this particular work. Thing, things like that can certainly come, but um, I would say focus on those green ones first because they will be um, your low hanging fruit, if I can put it that way. Uh, so the next one is the Pride and Sport membership. So I won't go through this in too much detail, but I'm happy to talk to the um, to individuals about this separately from today's session if you'd like. But our membership program has three tiers. So we have principal members, standard members, and small employer members. Um, so small employers are members for organisations with less than 100 staff. Um, the universities that we currently have on board for the most part are either principals, partnership members, or standard members. Um, just because there's different ranges or different levels of benefits that will come with that. Um, but across these three membership tiers, the things that all of you would receive, um, regardless of what tier you chose, is ongoing admin and technical support from either myself or another member of Pride and Sport. Um, we have annual meetings with you where we discuss um, strate specific strategies about what we need to do over the next 12 months period from when you start that membership. Um, you have access and ability to engage with other people in this space um, at LGBTQ roundtables and networking events, um, as well as uh, ongoing training and education. And there's different projects that we also run throughout the year that we bring different um, members on board with. So I want you to also think outside the square here. So we're not just talking about putting you in touch with other people at different universities who might be doing this same thing. If you're a Pride and Sport member, you'll also get the ability to engage with people at Tennis Australia, Rugby Australia, um, Football Australia, all the big sports and even state level sports as well. Whoever's working on the diversity inclusion work uh, in that organisation um, will likely be the key contact that works with Pride and Sport. So by being a part of roundtables, for example, um, you'll have the ability to pick the brains of people and different sporting organisations as to what they're doing and how that might be able to benefit you at a university level. Um, at all level as well, we offer crisis support. So these are some of the things like the Israel Folau and Margaret Court scenario that I mentioned earlier, that if there is a particular incident or issue that arises within your organisation, uh, we can most certainly assist you in that space. I mentioned earlier too about media training and consultation. We can do those sort of things. When it comes to governance and policy um, work, this is a space where it'll depend on your internal capacity. So if you have capacity to do this work yourself, we can most easily consult you and give you advice in this space. Um, alternatively, if you don't have that ability to write it yourself, we can write those policies for you, which we've done uh, quite substantially for another uh, a number of other organisations. Um, Similarly, you'll have access to rainbow merchandise, um, and if there's tailored projects or specific initiatives that we're doing throughout the year, you'll also get access to those. So to give you an example, since the start of this COVID pandemic, 
um, we've increased our engagement where we're doing online training every two to three weeks now for all of our members where they get to share with all of their staff and all of their athletes in some uh, in some cases to participate in LGBTQ awareness training. So that's like the 101 training. Um, we've also engaged with a number of organisations to assist us develop template resources for organisations. So the stuff that I was mentioning before within the index where we talk about strategic plans, inclusion policies, all the boring stuff, um, rather than you just going out and trying to build this yourself, we're now going to have these templates available for you that you can pretty much just copy and paste if you wanted to, um, or you could at least start with that and then build on that so it's more specific for your organisation. So there's quite a lot, and these are just some of the, the, the more exciting things, if I can put it that way, um, but these are just some of the examples that you get from membership. Uh, and then the final one on here is around the Pride in Sport Awards. So I didn't mention this at the start, but I also think, uh, but I think that acknowledgement of work in this space is really important. Um, the one thing I've learned across all areas of diversity inclusion, not just LGBTQ, but we can also talk about, um, you know, disability, cold and women and Indigenous, all that sort of stuff. The organisations that are doing well in this space are the ones that are telling their stories well. So it's the organisations that are acknowledging the people, the individuals, the groups, the clubs um, that are doing well in this space. So this is where I want you to use and abuse the Pride in Sport Awards. And again, this doesn't have to be a part of a membership or anything like that. But every year we run the National Pride in Sport Awards where it acknowledges um, all different types of people. So coaches, officials, um, out athletes, allies, uh, as well as organisations, initiatives, anything you can think, kind of think of, um, we'd like to acknowledge. So this is where I would say keep your eye out for the next round. Um, so, excuse me, we'll probably be starting to ask for nominations within the next month or two, um, and then it's early next year where the announcements uh, are made. Um, but have a look at these sorts of things um, because the awards night is not just about who's done well within the index, it's also about who's done well at community level, uh, you know, who's who's been a really good coach at your local clubs um, or who's a good staff member within your organisation that's done work in this space that we can acknowledge for their efforts, that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this one in too much detail because I want to give us enough time for a bit of Q&A, but look, I, I probably don't have to explain too much as to why this sort of work is important. Um, but the reality is if we don't do work in this space, um, then we're going to lose out. Um, and, and I can't... I probably can't put that more, uh, put more emphasis on it than that in the sense that, you know, if, if okay, we'll take it down another level. You know, us, us collectively need to do work in this space, but if you and your organisation don't do work in this space, then you're going to be missing out. Um, you know, you're going to be missing out and you're also going to have individuals within your organisation that are going to be doing things like, um, you know, continuously scanning or they're going to be hypersensitive um, you know, one of the things that I share in one of our training sessions is I talk about the experiences of someone who's hiding themselves uh, in a sporting context and the amount of effort and energy that they use just by trying to hide themselves. Um, and it could be things like if they hear gay slurs or if they, even they just they hear someone say the word gay or rainbow um, in a conversation that's happening on the other side of the room the effort and energy that that person can waste just trying to pay attention to that session to find out if that conversation is talking about them or not um, can be really detrimental um, to the performance of that individual. Um, so much so that we actually know that about 30% um, of energy is spent on individuals self-editing. So that's the people hiding their true selves. Um, so bearing that in mind, I just um, take that into account, you know, if you're not doing much work in this space. Um, but on the flip side too, if you do do the work, then your talent pipeline increases. You get the best candidates putting in for jobs at your organisation. You get the best people that are volunteering to be a part of your club committees. Um, and also you've got other people, whether that be within the university or in the community, um, that hear about how good you're doing in the LGBTQ inclusion space. Um, and they'll want to be a part of those sports at your club as well, uh, at your clubs. So with all of this sort of work that we do um, through the index, through the education and training, um, through memberships, all of that sort of stuff, gradually you start to see a bit more of a picture. And um, the reason why I put this one on here is uh, this, this on the screen now is because every area of the LGBTQ community is going to be different. They have their own unique stories um, and their own unique 
initiatives that we might need to do to ensure that they feel included. Now, I don't want to say this to kind of overwhelm you, but it's a good point to um, it's, a, it's a good point to touch on because I think sometimes um, we can get lost, or we can sometimes think or feel that you know LGBTQ inclusion is actually quite a small amount of work that we need to do. Um, but in essence, we're not trying to get you to have a separate piece of work for LGBTQ inclusion, particularly if you come through as a member. Um, we help you embed and incorporate this type of work um, into every aspect of business. So it's not just left on yourselves or one individual within the organisation to work on. So it is your HR department, it's your finance team, it's your communications team. Um, in some way, shape or form, we want to get everyone involved in this space because everyone has a part to play. So that's pretty much it. The the last three things I would say to you is, you know, in, in terms of what you can do now, we spoke about the index. That's free. Um, you get a lot from that. Uh, index submissions um, open, uh, I believe, in December each year, and then the marking is done and results come out um, in the first quarter of every calendar year. Um, so we've still got a bit of time up our sleeves to kind of achieve some work before the next one. Um, but at the very least, um, I would encourage every single one of you to get your organisation to do the index in the next round. Um, and either before or at that time as well, um, look at your own internal capacity um, to come on board as members. And I'm happy to have those separate conversations if you have that ability. Um, ultimately, and, and very much ideally, we'd love to see every university sport um, organisation on board as members in Pride in Sport. Um, there's so much more that I wasn't able to kind of go through today that in terms of benefits um, that you will achieve from being part of members. But if you want to hear, excuse me, what some of those benefits are and you don't want to listen to my voice anymore, um, I'd recommend and encourage you to um, touch base with um, either Melbourne University Sport, RMIT University Sport, um, or Macquarie University Sport in Sydney. Um, I know, you know, they might, might not necessarily be in your specific state, but I know you have good connections uh, with other universities. So talk to them, um, ask them questions about what they believe some of the benefits are. Um, and I'll guarantee you that they'll say that this is an initiative that you need to be a part of. And the last one here is just about those awards that we spoke about. So when they come out, take advantage of that um, and acknowledge people are doing well um, in this space. That's it. That's me, Carly. Um, I don't know whether you want to jump back in now, but happy to yeah, answer questions or if you've got anything else you want me to talk about. Might just well, thanks, 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 Bo. That, that was, was um, um, excellent. excellent. Cool. Um, um, just want to open up to the floor, floor if there's, if there's any, any questions. questions. Make sure you sure unmute, you unmute yourself. yourself. Uh, no, so, so Bo, I just had a couple of points. I just wanted to get further clarification and either from you or even Chris. Just um, starting out as a university sport department, um, how have you been able to, or what's some suggestions about best practice about bringing in other departments of the university on board? So many universities would have a separate department um it, it, that, that works in the lgbti space so what would be some i guess good first steps for a for a university support department to be able to come through yeah absolutely um really happy to hear what chris has to say about this one too but what i would say um and i probably neglected to say at the very start is that um out of our three programs that i mentioned so pride and diversity pride and health and pride in sport um in Pride and Diversity, there I think there's about 25 or 26 universities in Australia already a part of Pride and Diversity, so as a university as a whole. Yep. Um, and it's only recently that, you know, because you know, Pride and Sport is a, a much newer program, that we've had the emphasis or focus in the sporting sector. So there is a very good chance and a very good likelihood that your university as a whole is already doing work in this space and you may have an, uh, an ally network or rainbow network, those sorts of things. Um, at the very least, if you do have that, or at least find out if you do or not, but I, I think it would be wise to have a conversation internally with those individuals who may be working in that space. Um, and I'm happy to provide that list um, after today of, of who is a member of Pride and Diversity already. Um, because that would be 
I think something really beneficial and, and I might actually ask Chris if you want to add anything to that because I know every university is going to be different but Chris from Melbourne Uni has also been a part of the work that Pride and Sport and Pride and Diversity does so Chris I don't know whether you wanted to add anything. Yeah absolutely but I was just going to say that I completely agree with you um, it's definitely about tapping into the ally networks that, that might be at your university and also the people that work with Pride and Diversity if your university is a member um, I was lucky enough, so uh, Melbourne University established our first ally network right around the time I started working at MU Sport. Um, and I was really lucky to get a spot on the committee for that network, so I'm constantly in their meetings able to advocate on behalf of sport, which makes it really easy. Um, but yeah, I just encourage you to reach out to whoever may be working in that space at the university. And even if your university is not a member of Pride and Diversity, there might be a researcher, you know, there might be a student union that focuses in this space. Just, just Put yourselves out there and, and engage with some experts at, at the university because it's um, really beneficial. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Um, and probably the, the other question I have, um, obviously in the current environment we don't have students on campus. So relying more and more on a virtual um, the virtual world and, and social media platforms and things like that. And, and you mentioned about obviously visibility being such an important part um, along with the other policies and guidelines and, and education. But maybe some best practice and what you've seen so far this month about um, the Pride Month and, and just some good things or, or minimum things that they could, you know, university could potentially do to um, spread the message. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the examples are probably going to differ for yourselves and your own internal capacity. But if I look at some of the good work um, or some good examples that I have seen, um, you know, if you look at um, Macquarie University in Sydney, for example, they they had the luxury where they appointed uh, a Pride ambassador um, within their organisation kind of before the pandemic started or even just at the start. Um, but the one thing they did was get that person to do like some live stream videos on their Instagram account and Facebook page, that sort of stuff. Um, really, really simple things about them sort of sharing you know, why pride is so important, you know, why doing work in this space is important for that university. And and I think even if I look more broadly about other sports too, the, you know, there's a number of sports similar to water polo or touch football, not necessarily some of the real big ones, um, but they've taken this time to also ensure that their messaging isn't getting lost because of this COVID pandemic. And it can be simple things that, um, you know, I mentioned earlier in the presentation of encouraging them to participate in a day of significance. You know, there is at least one day of significance every month, if not more. Um, while each of them will have a specific theme, it's a really good opportunity for you to use that as your platform to say, you know, if it's Trans Visibility Day, for example, um, you know, use that day to encourage people from the trans community to contact you and have conversations with you. On the flip side too, I, I would say that not everything has to be publicly visible. Um, one of the, the key benefits, and I alluded to it before in terms of like internal training and things that we offer all of our members, um, there's a lot of conversation, there's, there's a lot of interest at the moment across all sports about trans and gender diverse inclusion, all right, in terms of, you know, how, how do we keep, how do we ensure that they're included and what does that look like for our individual sports? Um, and those conversations are going to be very unique for the specific sport we're talking about. But the beauty about one of the, the benefits we've allowed for members is that rather than doing public facing or many public facing forums to discuss those topics, we're now having a lot of internal forums where we're getting our members together, getting these key people in the same room or the same virtual room um, to have a conversation about this sort of stuff. Um, and then also encouraging people to collaborate with other organisations. So if I look at the, the top end of town and, you know, pardon the phrase, like for sport, we now have, and I'm just looking at my whiteboard, um, we've now got about 12 national sporting organisations that are working with Pride and Sport specifically on trans and gender diverse inclusion and what that looks like for their sport. Um, we know that there's a number of sports that have done that work already, um, but... Uh, I'm probably kind of going away from your original question, Kylie, but I, right. I think this is a good opportunity for us to at least know that, you know, just because we're all locked in isolation or in our own houses, those sorts of things, doesn't mean that we can't do work in this space. Um, and that's why I wanted to emphasize in, in the sense that work doesn't just mean, you know, 
putting something on social media, by but by all means, please go and do that because I think that's really important. Um, there's, but there's so much more that can happen behind the scenes as well. Um, and that's probably where most sporting organisations have actually spent their time and effort over the last two to three months um, is using this time of non-participation to ensure that they're, uh, they're you know, behind the scenes or their governance uh, is actually up to date and, and you know, adequate when it comes to the inclusion work they're doing. So, look, I, I think regardless of what you do, even depending on what your capacity is, if you can do something very small, participate in a pride, uh, you know, day of significance. Um, this month is Pride Month, so you can pick any day of the month um, slap a rainbow flag on a social media post, promote the fact that, you know, you did some training or education with me today, you know, and tag us and we'll, you know, reshare all of your posts, you know, get a little bit of acknowledgement out there. Um, if I can point out, and I, I think one of the reasons why you probably asked this, Kylie, because there's a really good example that we saw, um, it was only a couple of weeks ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kylie, but it was um, Federation University? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, and I'm probably not going to do this justice, so please go onto their social media site and um, and share it. But essentially, they did uh, a bit of like a virtual um, uh, gym challenge, and you might might have seen similar sort of things where you know they say you know you have to do um, 12 burpees and four push-ups or whatever it might be. But the Fed Uni actually did something specifically around uh, LGBTQ inclusion. And, Kylie, you might be able to elaborate a bit more because I'm trying to think of what it was. But So what they did is they yeah. had statistics. They did an infographic up and they had some really strong statistics, like similar to what Bo um, presented today. And, and if it was 17%, someone had to do 17 burpees or um, so they really connected an activity with the with the statistics, um, and it was just a simple infographic, and it was just really powerful. Um, you may have we also shared it through our platforms as well. So um, something like that as well. I'm conscious of time, um, but what I what I might do, um, I would encourage you to Melbourne University Sport. Uh, you may have heard Bo present, uh, sorry Chris present last year at our conference, but. They've done um, an enormous amount of work as well with their clubs, so getting their clubs board. And, and one of those things is, um, uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is a pledge or your club signed a pledge. Um, and what what I will do is we'll connect you um, with some of the work that, that that's publicly available. Um, and then not only will we share, Bo's just shared his contact details in the chat, but also um, reaching out to to Chris as well uh, at Melbourne University Sport and and as Bo said Macquarie and uh, and um, RMIT are also doing some some great work. So um, if there's any no other questions, we might um, we might wrap it up. But uh, Bo will do us a follow we'll do a follow up um, email yeah. and connect you up with with the people that are on on the course today. As I said, we'll, we've recorded this session and we'll share through our, through our website. But um, if there's no other question, thanks, Chris. Um, he's also put um, his email address in the chat. But if there's no other questions, um, any other questions at all, guys? Cool. I reckon I'll probably get a couple of emails with questions on them, but that's awesome. No, look, that's <laughs> fine. And it's really um, – it's it's a space that UD Sport um, are actively working in at the moment, and, and in the following days you'll you'll see some evidence of that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I appreciate your time today, uh, Bo, and um, I'll uh, – and thanks everybody for attending. I hope you've you've been able to walk away with some ideas and and um, it's sort of generated some thoughts and some um, information that you want to now go and seek.